Welcome to the SHS podcast, where we provide valuable information to business owners and entrepreneurs. Today, we're joined by Aaron Boker from Aronson LLC. Aaron is a CPA and partner over at Aronson. And Aaron, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Steve, for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, you know, uh, with the new administration coming in, there's been a lot of talk of uh, some changes that are going to occur, uh, whether good or bad or up or down or, uh, you know, definitely tax rates are going to change. So we'd love to uh, hear a little bit about you, uh, how long you've been in the business, how long you've been at Aronson, and, uh, and then we can get into the meat of what's going to be happening to everybody's taxes. So tell us about yourself. Oh, great. Thank you, Steve. Well, I'm Aaron Boker. I'm a tax partner with Aronson LLC. I've been with the firm 13 years now, and I have a focus in hospitality. So about 65% of my focus is the restaurants, the hotels, the food manufacturers, the distributors, and retails, primarily in the DC metropolitan area. And the rest of my practice is professional services, real estate, a little bit of GovCon, some tech companies, any off the wall DC entrepreneur you can think of. And I also represent a lot of high net worth individuals. So with that, I touch people from all, all sorts of revenue and all sorts of wealth you know, ranges and in various different industries. So that's why I have a good understanding as far as what this tax reform could mean for different people. And, you know, before I get into really the meat of this, you know, tax reform that could be coming, quote unquote, as many of you are aware, you know, Biden, you know, as he was running for president, there were some proposed tax legislative changes that he threw out there. And now that he got elected, and we're still waiting for the results, you know, with the two Senate runoff elections down in Georgia. So the question is, where does that leave us? And where does that leave us for next year or 22 and, and forward? And really what I want to do is really go over a lot of the highlights, you know, the big ticket items that are going to come with this potential tax reform. And before I get into the details, one thing I will tell you, it's all rumors. It's all rumors right now. I honestly don't know what he's going to get through. I mean, again, the Senate is a big place, so we don't know if it's going to be next year, if it's going to be 22. Is Biden going to have to compromise on things if it's not a clean sweep in the Democrats? Even if it's a clean sweep in the Democrats, he still may have to compromise on these things. So, so let me get right to it. The well, first thing I will write that uh, we're fortunate that at least for 2020, nothing is changing. So, you know, other than having to deal with PPP and sort of, you know, what that means for your uh, your net income at the end of the day, you know, that's going to be its own struggle and challenges. Right. But, you know, working with a CPA is going to be extremely important. But hopefully, you know, we're talking about, you know, 2021 and 2022 potentially. Uh, and getting ready and preparing for those types of potential changes, correct? That That is correct. And, you know, as Steve mentioned, 20 is okay. The only big thing for 2020 is the PPP loan forgiveness and the potential add back to taxable income. And I will caveat, I've been, in my career, I've been through a few rounds of tax reform. And generally, I say generally, when tax reform comes out, it's usually starting January 1st of next year. These are the changes, but you never know. They could backdate it to January 1st of this year. So we believe... It could be 22 and forward, but 21 is not off the table as I go over some of these changes that could be coming. All right, well, let's First, get into it. Absolutely. Sounds great. So I'm going to tell you offhand, I'll be straight up with everybody. A lot of these changes are really not going to impact most of the people, most of the taxpayers out there. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Objectively, really what Biden's purpose of potential tax reform is, is that he wants to go off the high income earner. He wants to go off the folks that are high income earners that have a lot of wealth. And what this means, what he's throwing out there is that for starters, one of the things he's thinking about doing is increasing Social Security taxes. And so what he's proposing is that right now in present day, you know, when you make, you know, W-2 wages, self-employment income, usually the first 140000 give or change, index for inflation is subject to Social Security tax. And then after that, it's just Medicare the rest of the way. So what he's thinking about doing is the first 140K is subject to Social Security and Medicare. And then you, you can pick up the Medicare tax like you would. But when you get to $400,000 of W-2 wages, the Social Security tax picks back up again. So if you think of it, it's like a, a donut for Social Security tax. And so it's this way to kind of bring some more revenue to the government. But also, you know, he's one of the first presidents that I've seen address this in a long time. He's trying to resolve the Social Security tax dilemma. And so that's one idea that he has out there. The other thing that he's thinking about doing is that 
talking about increasing the highest tax rate from 37.6 to 39 percent, which, you know, not a, not a big change, but I'll tell you what that could mean in a little bit. But I'll tell you offhand, right now the highest tax bracket is it's 518000 you know, of income if you're single. It's $622,000 for married couples. So again, as I mentioned earlier, that's going to be very, you know, exclusive of a lot of people. While 37.6 to 39 percent is not a big deal, but here's where it could make a difference. If you have an S corp or an LLC, which is what's known as a pass-through entity, and what happened was when the last round of tax reform came out, you were allowed to claim what's known as this 20 percent pass-through entity deduction. So I'm not going to go in the nuts and bolts of how that works, but if you're in a business that pays out wages, if you're not on that bad list of you know law firms, medical practices, accountants, you know professional services, for lack of a better term, you get a 20% haircut on your LLC and your S corp income. And what this did for the high income earners is that 37% income on that business income, you know, multiplied by 80%, it went down to 29.6. And what Biden is also proposing now is that if you're eligible to do that QBI deduction, once you make above 400,000, that QBI deduction, that 20% haircut, also begins to phase out and go away. So you go from an effective tax rate of 29.6 to potentially 39%. So that's a 10% increase roughly. And that I think could be a big game changer for a lot of our clients and a lot of you know taxpayers out there that make over $400,000 and have a qualified trader business that was previously taken this 20% deduction. So that could be a big plan and item potentially. So to, to kind of think about that in a second, just to translate that into layman's terms, prior to, to this potential tax change, right? If you're making over $600,000 a year, you're essentially considered a high income earner. And right. that's where you, know, you were taxed at a different level. Here, what the Biden administration potentially could be planning on is really saying that if you make over 400, you're considered a high income. That's earner. correct. I, so yep, that's a drastic that's change. I mean, two hundred thousand dollar change. It is a big change. And to be honest, from a planning standpoint, other than maybe accelerating income into 20 or 21, depending upon the time of this, there honestly is not a lot you can do around. It. I mean, if you make the big bucks, you make the big bucks. There's just there's no loopholes, unfortunately. And again, as I mentioned, as, and Steve mentioned, it's really Biden's way of going after the high income earners to make up some of the shortfall and bring some tax revenue into the government, which is what he's after. And here's another big ticket item as well. And this is capital gains rate. There's been a lot of rumors flying around about capital gains rates. As it stands right now, capital gains rates are 15% for most taxpayers, but 20% if you're in the highest tax bracket. And what Biden is proposing is if you're a high income earner, and but for this purpose, if you make over a million dollars, that capital gains rate goes from 20 percent to 39 percent, 39.6, almost doubling the tax rates that were previously paid under capital so gains it becomes, rates. It essentially becomes ordinary income. That's right. And so the play might be, you know, if you have a lot of, um, you know, capital gains you're anticipating or a lot of securities with built in gains or you're looking to sell a business potentially, consider maybe doing it this year or next year, potentially. Contingent upon when tax reform comes, whatever is you know is in your power potentially. So there's some big things to think about. But one thing that I noticed that was in common about this, this is all after the, the high income earners so far. And this is for the federal tax rate. This doesn't even That's, calculate and take into account the state tax rate you have to pay on top of that, which may correct. change as well. Right. One thing that I've not seen a lot of, but I imagine this is going to be on the table, was that with the last round of tax reform, while they gave out a lot of things in layman's terms, but there was one thing they took away, and that was the state and local tax deduction, where, you know, here in the D.C. area, you pay a lot of taxes, D.C. and Maryland, you throw in your property taxes, and then you would usually had the benefit of deducting all those state and local taxes. But right now, under current law, it's capped at $10,000. So what Biden's administration may do, and I say may do, is they might reinstate that SALT, that state and local tax deduction. So instead of having that $10,000 ceiling, you may be able to deduct as much as possible. So just a rumor. We'll have to wait and see what happens. But that could be one thing that maybe goes the other direction. And do you, what do you think about the uh, deductibility of the limit, I should say, deductibility of the uh, mortgage interest? Do you think that's going to as well be held up or is that going to change potentially? You know, it's hard to say. I've seen, I have not seen a lot out there, but I could see that going either way. 
But I think in all honesty, I wouldn't be surprised if Biden decides to leave it because under the old regime, you know, you were able to deduct mortgage interest up to a million dollars and then it would get phased out, you know, dollar for dollar as you went up the food chain. And then what Trump's administration did was unless that debt was grandfathered, you know, in prior to the end of 2017, that ceiling got reduced to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. And I honestly would not be surprised if Biden leaves that because his rationale is that, hey, if you can afford a mortgage, you know, high six figures, low seven figures, you're doing all right for yourself. You don't really don't need this mortgage interest deduction. So we'll have another one. We'll have to wait and see what happens. So to be determined. But I'm going to shift gears for a second. So we were really covering more on the individual stuff and on the flow through stuff. I'm going to talk about C Corps briefly for a moment. As it stands right now with C Corps, you know, C Corps, you know, the tax rates got lowered under Trump's administration. The tax rates right now are flat 21 percent, which is very advantageous, especially for the big, you know, the Microsofts, the big Apples, you know, the big corporations. And I'll tell you offhand, working with a lot of Aronson clients, you know, unless it makes sense, you know, we usually try and steer away from C corporations. There are some exceptions. And the reason being is that in a C corp, if you make all this profit, you pay one tax, but then you accumulate all these earnings and profits and you got to pay it out at some point, usually in the form of a dividend. So what happens is you pay 21 percent, you know, at the federal level, you pay out a dividend, you get whacked for another 15, 20 percent potentially. And then you throw in the state taxes. So it, honestly, it's not very tax advantageous. But like I said, there are some exceptions. But what Biden is thinking about doing is he wants to raise the C corp rates from 21 percent to 28 percent. So that's a 7 percent increase. And I'll tell you offhand, that's probably not going to change a lot of the advice we've been giving clients because we you know when the C corp rates came out back in the end of 17, we had a lot of people that are going C corp, C corp, C corp. And we were telling them, Eh, not so fast, you know, because you still have the issue of double taxation. And while the 21 to 28 percent differential might make it a little bit less attractive, I think our strategy is still going to be the same with clients. Unless, you know, you're in a business where it makes sense. If you're looking to do a cash out, you know, of a business in five years, as an example. Otherwise, you know, we generally like to do flow through taxation unless it's out of your control. Sometimes these companies, they raise big private equity, big venture capitalists, and they say, nope, you're doing C-Corp. I don't want a K-1 from you. So it all depends. But that's something to think about as you plan for C-Corps down the road. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Yep. Well, it, it seems like a higher tax rate uh, all across the board. I mean, you know, if you combine in the C-Corp, you combine the, the corporate tax rate and then the individual tax rate. Uh, that's correct. I agree with you. I'm going to shift gears in another area, and this is going to be a big area that I think is going to be drastically impacted by Biden's administration. And this area has been, you know, beat up for a while, and that's a state tax. And there's really two areas of concern that we have with the estate tax. But let me tell you about how it works right now and where it could be going. Under present law, what happens is when you pass away and assuming, you know, stuff doesn't go to a second spouse, what the government says is you're allowed to die with wealth up to eleven and a half million dollars, assuming there were no gifts that were done during your lifetime. And if you pass over and above eleven and a half million dollars, the government assesses an estate tax, like an asset tax, which is roughly about 40 percent. So let's say, for instance, you pass away with 12 million, assuming no gifts, 12 minus eleven and a half, that's half million dollars of income that's taxed at 40 percent. And then the second thing right now is that when you pass away and you give assets to a spouse or you know children or family members, you're allowed to get what's known as a step up in the assets. So another example, let's say you bought stock during your lifetime for $1,000 and now it's worth a million dollars. And assume, let's ignore the estate tax for a second. You give that stock to your children when you pass away, they get that stock and their basis in that stock is a million dollars. So in, in, as it works right now, they could take that million dollars of stock on date of death, cash it out tomorrow and not have any capital gains tax. Unlike if dad sold the stock during his lifetime, he would pay capital gains tax on a million minus a thousand dollars. So with all that said, there are two big changes that could be coming potentially. The first one is there's been a lot of rumblings and grumblings, you know, particularly from the Democrats that, and I say this objectively, that 
eleven and a half million dollars is a very high threshold as far as a wealth, you know, or an estate limitation. So what they want to do, or what Biden wants to do, is lower that down to three and a half million dollars, which is a big swing from eleven and a half to three and a half. And while that's still going to weed out a lot of people in this country, but in the D.C. metropolitan area, three and a half million dollars. You know, if you throw in a business, house, any stocks, or any retirement accounts, you might burn through that pretty quickly if you're lucky. Now, there are some things you can do where if you're married, you could do a, a portability election where if spouse one dies, you could transfer the exemption to spouse number two. So you can double up the exemption to seven million dollars. But that's a big haircut. And one thing is this could be, you know, over the next year or so, this could be the opportunity where if you really have massive wealth, this could be an opportunity to transfer, do some estate planning, do some gifting. So that way you can get that wealth out of your estate. Because right now under present law, you're allowed to gift up to $11.5 million under your lifetime. And if this thing goes through, you're only allowed to gift up to $3.5 million in your lifetime. So that could be a big cha game changer, especially for our clients who are with a lot of high net worth in this area. The second area, and I think this could be very problematic for everybody, regardless of how much wealth you have, and that's the, uh, the, the tax-free step-up that I mentioned. What Biden is proposing, and actually Canada does something very similar like this, where if you die and your assets go to a beneficiary, there would be a built-in gains tax, as if you sold the asset. So back to my example, if dad dies and his stock goes to his children, you know the children would be on the hook for paying a tax on a million dollars of stock minus dad's basis of a, of a thousand dollars and that's and that's whether or not it's cashed whether it's cashed in or not so does that exactly. include the home asset as well that's correct and that's a big problematic area because i just think about some clients where you know grandma or mom or dad they pass away and they've got real estate and that's all that's in their name and it's not uncommon for the next generation to live in that house and so if the house is going to the next generation and we have this built-in gains tax, how do you pay the taxes? And the only way I see feasible is you got to sell the assets to come up with the, the tax money effectively. And so I think that could be a big, a big area. And that's one where I honestly don't know if Biden's going to get that through, you know, contingent upon what happens in Georgia. I don't know if his Democratic colleagues are going to be happy with that one. So that's a gray area, but we'll have to wait and see. But that's something to think about potentially as you plan or even asset planning, regardless of how much in wealth you have. So it's interesting because, you know, the first part of this, you talked about really the tax side, right? And the tax side really, uh, you know, will affect some people, you know, because mm -hmm. of the $400,000 threshold and the, the, the C-Corps and all that. But when you talk about the estate side, I mean, we none of us really want to think about, you know, dying. But, you know, at the end of the day, thinking about what you have built over your lifetime and how that could translate at some point to your family, um, it's, it's really a lot of food for thought because, you know, it's, it's not that it's hard to, to um, it, it is, I should say, it, it's hard to build wealth, right? So it's hard to build wealth and store that. But, but what's, what's even harder is how do you plan for, from an administration to another administration, how do you plan for trusts and irrevocable trusts, right? And revocable trusts and gifting to your children when, you really don't know what you're going to need in your later years, right? If you're used to living a certain lifestyle and you've got $15 million worth of assets to gift that down to where the taxes is minimized, but still be able to live in your later years with access to those funds, it seems like this is becoming a difficult, uh, a difficult thing to start to plan for now, all these changes. Right. And one thing I will say, Steve, whenever I have that difficult conversation about the estate tax and what could be coming, the first thing I always ask my clients is, what do you want? These are your assets. What do you want? Do you want to give them to your spouse? Do you want to give them the next generation? Do you plan to, to basically cash everything out before you die? Is it? I've had some clients where everything's going to charity. I've had some clients say where I want to limit the estate tax as much as possible. Some clients have said, I don't care. It is what it is. But you've got to think through what do you want for yourself? That's step one. And then step one, once you figure out what you want for yourself, as far as your family, the estate tax bill, quote unquote, then you can have that higher level discussion on how do you plan for it? Because, you know, sometimes there may be some estate planning tools that make sense. Sometimes they don't, you know, because I've had some clients where if you gift assets, what you got to remember is it's carryover basis. So 
if dad gives his stock that I mentioned that's worth $1,000, or that's what he paid for it, and he gives it to his children during his lifetime as an estate planning tool, well, the kids step into his shoes, and they have the stock at $1,000, you know, before and after he passes away. So it's a lot of stuff to think about here, but you really got to, what we really want to do is really start planting the seeds for what could be coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Which is all really up in the air at this point. And so it's really, you know, working with, you know, you, uh, and, uh, and tax planning and strategizing, that's really what's critical right now is don't think of your CPA, right, as a once a year uh, advisor. It really needs to be where you're in constant communication during the year with your CPA to make sure that you're aware of all the changes, what's going, especially if you own a business and have some assets. You need right. to plan for all of this. I think that that's is one of the key takeaways. Exactly. It's a lot to think in, but you got to start having that conversation now with accountants, other advisors, just what does this mean for me? You know, where do things stand right now? What does this mean? But there's just a lot of unknowns. You know, is it going to be 22, 21? You know, the Senate in Georgia is going to have a big you know, play in this. So there's a lot to be determined. So but you got to start thinking about this stuff. That's the key thing in present day. At the end of the day, right, nothing is finalized for sure. We just know that something is going to happen, right? What is going to happen? We don't know. So knowing uh, is half the battle, right? So knowing that something is coming, making sure you're in communication with your CPA, with your financial advisor, tax planning, being smart about your business and the expenses that you deduct, getting ready for the lack of deductibility of PPP or potential deductibility of PPP. <laughs> Uh, expenses, I think really the key uh, at the end of the day is to just be aware. And that's what we provide on our channel is really the information to help, right? Those business owners and entrepreneurs. So Aaron, uh, thank you for sharing with us. Uh, how can somebody get in contact with you if they need to? Sure. There's one of two ways. They can call my direct line at 240-364-2582, or you can email me at a boker, a b O K E R at Aronson, A R O N S O N L L C dot com. And by the way, watch your spelling with Aronson and Aaron. They're very close, but just be careful with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Aaron, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing this information uh, with our viewers. And I know they're going to get a lot of valuable and useful information out of it. Right. Now, thank you, Steve, for having me. Always a pleasure. Appreciate it. Definitely.